Jack, now how old are you? I'm 80. 80? You waited five years I for this it, car. I bought, it, I bought it 53 years ago. 53 years ago. Stan was three and a half. Yes. <laughs> yes. That is crazy. I remember like it was yesterday when he come running out when I drove up up there, you know. I'm Stan Curtis. Uh, this is my father, Jack Curtis. I had three small children, so I go down and I spot this Roadrunner, and my family just loved it. I knew when I bought that car that I'd never get rid of it. There she comes, Jack! The car is here. She is about to pull in the driveway. You know, we do cars for all kinds of different folks. In some cases, the cars that are in the parking lot waiting to go through are, are in process are cars that people have bought as an investment. Like they've always wanted a Hemi Cuda, so they find one for sale on eBay or somewhere and they buy it and they send it to me to restore. I enjoy working on those cars and meeting all the great people. Some of the cars sometimes are one owner cars or nearly one owner cars, meaning somebody bought them when they were a year old or two years old. So in the case of the Curtis's car, they bought this car brand new. We interviewed the dad. He said, I wanted a car I could haul my family with, and that was the 68 Roadrunner. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Buried deep in the Pacific Northwest, one team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible, finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman. His cousin, Doug. His daughter, Alyssa. His best friend, Royal. His painter, Will. And the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest fiercest and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. There's a lot of other cars that we've done over the years and some that are in the queue now that are both original owner cars and cars that were bought only when they were a couple years old. So I, I always go back to Kimberly Cook's little 1970 Barracuda convertible, little EF8 green 3 two barrel air conditioning car. Her dad bought that car when it was only a couple years old. But listening to the stories and feeling the sentiment and seeing pictures of her as a little girl next to the car helping her dad work on it, those are the moments that to me, regardless of the persona I put on, a tough guy, could, well, I am a tough guy too, but I'm also a very sensitive guy when it comes to family and history, and I loved that story. You know, I wasn't there for the reveal, but watching it back, like the rest of America, even my dad got choked up, and that was hard, hard to see. I know that that really meant a lot to him as well as Kimberly. I can relate because if someday Something happens to my dad and he's no longer here. You know, I think the only way that I'd feel close to him again would be to get into a Mopar. I can totally understand why she was bawling and you know, that probably brought her right back to when her dad was alive. You know, my dad's attention to detail is also phenomenal, as we all know. And I think it was really cool how he put her dad's original steering wheel back in the car. I don't think Kimberly Cook expected that. So that was, <laughs> poor girl, she was just bawling. <laughs> But I don't blame her, like, oh my gosh. But that was just so cool that my dad did that, snuck that in on her, and made it that much sweeter. Another honorable mention is the Zinx 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner Lemon Twist Yellow four-speed car. They did not buy it new. In fact, what he did was he bought that car to emulate a car he did buy when he was back in high school and was married in and, and went on their honeymoon in and had years of history with. This car was able to fill that void for him. That was a great story. I'm always a huge fan of doing these cars for people that have the great stories. They're super nice and just a pleasure to be around. That car was yellow, came out great the second time, third time I painted it, because we do the pre-paints at that time. And then I panel painted the car because it was solid color meaning I painted parts and pieces all different times. But for some reason, I can't explain it, I am not smart enough to paint yellow. I will say that. Every time I paint yellow, I have to repaint it. I gotta, I gotta agree with old Willie on this one. I don't agree a lot, but uh, apparently he's too stupid to paint a yellow car. 
I've told them a hundred times how to do it, that you count the number of coats that you put out. I've done tutorials on this stuff. But if you don't follow that, then the paint doesn't match. So you have to have a brain. Now that's a great reason why the Scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz wasn't a car painter. He could do a lot of things. He could sing, he could dance, he can run up and down the yellow brick road. That's all great stuff, right? The point is, you got to have a brain. So we blocked the car down, reshot it all as one, did the stripe on it, did the reveal. From start to finish, the car went great, clients were happy, and it was a win-win for everybody. They remember what they were wearing, what they did in the car, you know, restaurants, running around cruising it. They, they have stories with that car from the time they bought it till now. You could sit down with these people and talk for hours on end about their memories about it. And those are the stories that for me mean the very, very most. So when a car sets, as long as this one had sat out beside the house, getting rained on, sitting in the mud, it's going to have problems down the road. Once that car got here, we disassembled it completely, right down to the bare original shell. That's what we do. Once we had it disassembled, we had to decide what metal we're gonna send out to have dip. So we did end up sending out the body itself to have dip, the trunk lid, and both doors. But the front sheet metal was rusty enough, I didn't think it was gonna make it, so we just put new AMD parts on there. When it came back from the dipper, it had a ton of problems. It had a lot of rust in it, and I mean a lot of rust. We ended up replacing nearly every piece of sheet metal on it. We didn't end up doing the roof skin, but we did do the main floor, the step wells, the under seat pan, the trunk floor, the trunk floor extensions, both quarter panels, a rocker section on the right hand side, the left front apron, the left front frame rail had to be replaced, the rear cross member, rear cross member extensions, both quarters if I didn't mention that already. So it was a lot of metal work that needed to be done on the car, but that's what we were getting paid for. When it got out to the mud room, we had one guy start it and then he left us. Then we had to have another guy jump in on it, which is always like hard to take over where someone left off. So he actually found himself having to actually go back and almost start the car completely over to get it where it needed to be. Once we got the bodywork up to speed, we were able to start the priming process where we prime and block, prime and block, do that three times to get it ready to start taking it apart to do our jam work. So after we get the first prime done, it takes a week or two for that primer to dry. At that point, set outside, we'll bring another car in, work on it, and then when that two weeks is up, we'll grab that car, bring it back in. It's nice, it's hard. We use the VP7050 as our primer. It's thick, it's like honey coming out, and it does a remarkable job. So then we'll get the whole car blocked, do our second prime, and sometimes we're, we're good to go after the second prime, but most time, we'll do it a third time just to be safe. We get the whole entire car washed, put back in the booth, masked up. Then I'll put my first coat of sealer on, and that sealer's just to fill any imperfections that we may have missed or overlooked. It's just like a safety blanket. So we'll seal it, then we go right into our color, and it's not a, it's not a transparent color. Cover's really good. It's a beautiful color. So you're looking at five or six coats of color, three coats of clear, let that dry, goes right over to Noah to get the cut and buff done, and then we can get it over here for assembly. The car came out great, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the whole car put together. So this is the first interview for season 15. Now, everybody at home sat back. You guys understood. I heavily produced 14. That's why our numbers were through the roof. You know, I'm sorry. I got to call BS on that. Will has lost all of his faculties. He is no longer in reality. Something about being a star has gone to his head, and he's lost his entire capacity to be real. He doesn't produce a show. Will, you don't produce a show. You don't have anything to do with the production other than occasionally setting it back, all right? You have some kind of fun little relationship with our director back there, but you're not producing or directing or anything else. I just want to make sure the folks at home know that, all right? Somebody's got to stand up and tell the truth. When we sin in silence, when we should protest, makes cowards of all men. It's Ella Wilcox. Jackie, what do you remember about when it first came? We heard a meet me, and we didn't know what was going on. Did you hear the bee beep that Jackie did? I did, but I, I couldn't figure it out because I wasn't watching Roadrunner. I was watching Bugs Bunny. When these cars come in, they are so rusted away to nothing 
life and mother nature and time takes a huge toll on these cars and it's understandable that people have to let them sit for a long time and when they come to us there isn't much left. When I started this drivetrain it looked horrible. It was so caked in mud and rust and it just didn't even look like it was restorable but that just made me want to work harder and I was glad to do it for the customer. It is so rewarding to be able to take an engine that has sat for maybe 35 years without running, give it to Doug, let him completely disassemble it, send it off to the machine shop, have all the machine work done, and know that it made it through those critical points of what? A magna flux that could have came back with a broken block, a crack in the valley somewhere, we've seen that, or cylinders that have to be bored out so far that they need sleeves. That was the case on one cylinder in our 426 Hemi for Melita. So sometimes, the original parts are so pitted and rusted that we can't use them. In a non-numbers matching situation, we can just replace them out. But if it is a numbers matching restoration, we have to work a lot harder to bring these parts back to life so that we can make this an original numbers matching car. So I can understand what these people are going through wanting to see their cars come back in the shape that they used to be in years ago. If I could see my old Barracuda come back in the condition it was when I was 18 years old, looking just the way it did back in that day, it would just be heart-stopping for me. You mean the car your daddy bought you, Doug? Is that the one you're talking about? The nice little 70 Barracuda 318 four-speed air conditioning car, probably one of one ever built. It wasn't age. It wasn't anything as, as quaint as age and dilapidation. It was destruction. The guy beat the tar out of that. He kicked its kidneys in every day. He was doing a reverse burnout, which I don't even know why. Rev it up and dump it in reverse till the motor mouse broke. I don't get it. He backed up one time right down the road here on 39th Street to a mound of dirt so the rear valance would cave into the dirt, lift the weight off of the tire, and then he spun the tire and it had enough friction against the rock that it was set on that it would smoke. Because apparently that was the only way he could smoke the tires. You understand, that is not dilapidation. That is destruction. Mark has been referring to my reverse burnout where I backed up against a stump. Well, that's not completely how it happened. I just backed up the side of a mill pond, broke traction, stood there on the pedal, and spun my tire in reverse until the tire popped. I had such a nice cloud of smoke going up in the air on this blue moonlit night. It was the most awesome thing there was. That is ridiculous. My mom loved Dougie dearly. It was one of her favorites. Uh, but she always said, you know, whatever Dougie does, do the opposite. You just got to tell that truth. Me and Ella. So I know I talked about it earlier. This car came with factory 14 by 6 Magnum 500 wheels. But if it were a Hemi car, it could have had a 15-inch wheel, never a 15-inch Magnum, but a 15-inch wheel. Well, now in today's world, they make them. Classic Industries offers a 15 by 6 Magnum 500 all chrome wheel, correct for the 68 model cars, but that way you can put an F7015 on it, get more road feel, get more tire fill in it up, and that's what we opted to do. I talked to Mr. Curtis about it, so that's the setup we went with. They even replicate the 15-inch Redline tires. What do you riding remember in, about riding it? in the back of the <clears throat> windshield? You used to have to fight to ride in the yeah, back of the that's windshield. True. That's true. <laughs> in 1970, the Plymouth Roadrunner came standard from the factory with the 383 Roadrunner engine. What engine was not available in the 1970 Roadrunner? Was it the 444 barrel? the 446 barrel, or the 426 Hemi? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, folks, how did we do on that one? What engine was not available from the factory in a 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner? If you guessed the 446 barrel, well, you're wrong. It actually was introduced in 69 and available and continued all the way through the 71 model year. However, if you guessed the 444 barrel, you're absolutely right. That's right, you could not get the 375 horsepower 444 barrel engine in a 70 Roadrunner. 
Get it in a Charger, get it in a Challenger, you could get it in a Cuda, get it in anything except the medium price range cars. You couldn't get a Super B with a 444 barrel, and you couldn't get a 70 Roadrunner. I didn't get to help Justin with the second skin on this vehicle, but I love how it's coming together. It's so beautiful. That blue is amazing. It just pops. It's really when the chrome and trim go on these cars that they come alive. The bumpers make the biggest difference with all that chrome. It just shines. Installing the grill and headlight bezels make the front end take its shape. The mirrors, handles, and taillights all make the car whole. So the dash came in for the 68 Roadrunner. It looks really good. Uh, you know, this is just a simple dash, too. It had the horizontal gauges, but with the two-tone blue in this car, it really sets it off and makes it look really nice. Installing the dash is one of the last things I have to do this car to finish off the restoration of the interior of this car. I'll let you drag it through. This is the fun part. We're getting ready to put the dash in the car. You know, it's always nice to be able to work with Mark uh, when he can stay focused and everything, and uh, sometimes he can get sidetracked. But getting the dash in the car, uh, make all the connections, tip this thing up, you know, bolt it right into place, and then I can install the steering column. Nice. Well, that was smooth. Really easy, yeah, nice. You ever see American Graffiti? Oh, yeah. Which car did you like better, the 32 or the 55? Uh, 55. Explains a lot. Listen, it takes all kinds of cars to make the world go round, but a 55 Chevy, a double nickel Chevy, this is a belly button car. Everybody had one, at least at one point in their life, right? 32 Ford's totally cool. 55 Chevy, mmm. Kids in school had 55 Chevys. I wanted to punch our faces in. You want to get that last one? Because our mommies and daddies gave them to them. That's what happened with a 50. Well, that'd be perfect for you. <laughs> Your dad gave you a brand new Daytona in 69. What year were you born? That. What year were you born? 89. 89? Well, gave you a brand new Daytona in 89. I've seen the pictures of you. You were a spooner, you and Dougie. Well, that was my dad's car. You had hey, Daytona I bought my car. and mini bikes and gold I bought cards. my car my freshman you year. You had all for your teeth, bucks. full head of hair, good vision, the best of everything. Oh. Me, nothing. You're just, just mad about the colorblind still? I'm still pretty upset over the colorblind. It's a bummer. It's a nice green dash. <laughs> All right, I'll let you finish putting it together. Awesome, thanks, good, Mark. Good job, Alice. 55 Chevy, really? I mean, whatever, right? That's what you want to be known for, but I mean, where I come from, <laughs> Nims was fighting. Nims was fighting words back in the day. 1970 Charger, 440, ass stomping, fire breathing, tire roasting, panty dropping machine. Hey Dougie, Justin likes 55 Chevys. <laughs> what is it like working with Mark when he gets off topic? <laughs> so working with Mark when he gets off topic, sometimes you just don't know what to do. During this, I just I said, cut the mics, cut the mics, because typically after that. Everything that's being said doesn't need to be said. If you guys have watched the show for many, many years, it's the same things that get recycled over and over and over. You know, same characters, same movies. It's just the same thing. So you're basically watching reruns. My comedy is not reruns, okay? Most of my stuff is new with a little bit of a spin on it. I know I've done a lot of different impressions and some of them are repetitive, but there's different things being said. You don't go up to a comedian and say, well, oh, Jerry Seinfeld, you already did, what's, what's, what's the deal with the bag of peanuts? It can use it for all kinds of different things. This season, I'm bringing in Dr. Jed Hill from Malice, right, Alec Baldwin's character, the, the God Complex thing, I'm bringing that back, that's fresh. And even if it was reruns, would it really, really matter? Because syndication can make you a lot of money, right? So you take Gilligan's Island, it's the most syndicated television show in history. I would say that the guy who looks like the love child of Kevin Farley and Alan Hale probably ought to know that. You, you know what I'm saying, Skipper? <laughs> yeah, do that one. Yeah. I push the lotion on the skin. 
What the hell is that? Snagglepuss doing <laughs> Jane Gum? Uh, it's a stage ride. That's ridiculous. I sound exactly like Jane Gum. Well, Park wouldn't be taken to make it his own. He's like, oh, push the dash in the car. Something like that. I don't go for the table jokes like most comedians do, where they say, it puts the lotion on its skin, it does this, whatever it's told. I don't do that. I come up with new stuff, other obscure lines from the movie, so people don't even know who you're doing. Or, uh, yeah, uh, that's Mrs. Lippman's son used to live here. I think I've got his card. You can come inside. <laughs> What's another impression? He was, uh, uh, his Rocky is. <laughs> does he do that? He does it all the time. Yeah, Rocky, Rambo. Now I'm Yogi Balboa. Hey, boo boo. Oh, uh, Mr. Ranger, not gonna like this. <laughs> In what world does my Rocky Balboa? <laughs> is Boo Boo Bear and Yogi Bear. It isn't. Rocky Balboa don't fight with a picnic basket, does he? In his corner, he's got nothing. He's got Mick. Hello, Mick. Come in, can't see. I don't want to do it, kid. Come in, Mick, can't see. And he cuts his eye, and he goes out, and he does a little bit of magic. He warms up Apollo Creed's ribs, gives him a couple of South Paws, South Jersey, South Hampton, South Paw. What is it we're talking about again? So installing the steering column is a two-man job. One guy under the hood feeding the coupler onto the steering box. One guy has to get inside up under the dash and line it up, feed it through, and we have to align the splines on the coupler. Restoring drivetrains is not all I do. I help a lot of people do a lot of different tasks around here. So I consider myself a jack of all trades. Mark considers me a master of none. That, sir, is not true. I think that Doug is a great technician, very valuable asset to Graveyard Cars. Now, that doesn't mean I don't still think he's from another planet, okay? One, I've asked his dad, Doug, for a birth certificate. Never been able to produce one, right? No birth certificate? Yeah, it got lost. Okay, order another one, right? Records, you can get those through records. I'm gonna be the one that's screwed here, ultimately, is what if Baldar or whatever it is up there decides he wants them back? You going under the Speedo cable or above it? Under, or over. Over? Yeah. Okay. Oh, man. Man, that's lit on like, like it was nothing. Sometimes we get lucky. Oh, wait. What's wrong? Don't say that. Oh, heavens to Betsy Ross, what have you done? See, I'm beginning to think that Doug is wearing off on Justin, or maybe, maybe Justin can no longer hide it. Maybe he's an alien too, all right? All I can say is the steering column was in there, it went down, the splines lined up, everything looked great. Next thing you know, Mork and Mindy are taking it back out again, all right, for some reason, maybe just to ride the clock for another hour and a half before they reinstall it. That actually has a good cadence to it, Mork and Mindy. I like that. Remind me to refer to Justin as Mindy from now on. You know what I mean, Tiny? <laughs> Gots to keep it real. Once I'm finished installing the steering column on the 1968 Roadrunner, you just have to make a few more connections and you got power to the whole system. this car like 50 times and he never would sell it. He always said, I'm going to fix it up one day and I'm like, sure you are, you know, and so uh, I'm excited for it. I am too. Over the years, everybody's watched us evolve as a shop. I mean, I will be the first to tell you that when you first started watching the show in 2012, we didn't have all the key vendors that we have now. We didn't have all of the equipment that we have now. We didn't even have necessarily the knowledge, because you do learn. Every day you learn something in this business. The exhaust system that we opted to go with on all of our cars now is the ECS exhaust. This is a duplicate 
of the factory. It isn't an attempted duplicate where they just use modern clamps for it. This is the way the exhaust system is if you had an original car. So yeah, we're even putting an ECS system on our 68 Roadrunner 3 to 3 four-speed car. Why? Because the guy paid me to make the car like new. That's the system it would have had when it was like new. So one thing I want to mention real quick is that we put a brand new replica 043 radiator in it. Because when the car came here, it did not have the correct radiator in it. It had a 22 inch, but it wasn't the correct one. Should be an 043 radiator. So I reached out to Bob uh, at Glen Ray. He's been a friend of mine now for years. We get all of our radiators from them. And I said, man, we are so far over budget on this thing. And I'd love to give him the right radiator. I told him a little bit of the backstory. He said, well, I'd love to help you out, but this ain't UNICEF. You know, maybe one day UNICEF will get in the radiator business and they'll be the folks to see, <laughs> which is a Joe Dirt line, dear day which I always think is funny. I kind of stole it and used it as my own. But anyway, after that, I got off the phone, I went out back and I found one. I sent it out to have it record. The day I was sending the radiator out to have it rebuilt, one showed up and guess who it was from? Old Bobby Claus, Glen Ray Radiator. So thank you, that was a very nice thing that you did, Bobby. You're a good man. The 68 Roadrunner is a pretty simple car. Uh, it's got some, you know, some cool things that go on the exterior of it. They got their little Roadrunner plaques that we put on the doors. And since this is a 68, it actually has the black and white Roadrunner decals that sit right next to the door plaques. The decals are my favorite part. And even though Will and I completely f***ed up, I still love billboards and I still love graphics. I just don't like doing them. You know, after I saw the episode of Shrek and Fiona putting the decals on the 71 Cuda, I laughed out loud. And I'm not a big LOL guy. You'll never see that little thing from me. I don't do that. But I literally laughed. You know, they're, they're like a comedy team. They could be a great comedy team. What are they doing at Graveyard Cars? This one's really cool. If I understood Mark correctly, late in 68, Plymouth acquired the rights. So the tail panels got the colored bird. You were wrong on that, Mindy. The actual reason behind it, although that is a urban legend and I probably have even spouted it off a few times, the real answer behind the black and white bird versus the full color bird is that when the Roadrunner was conceived, there was a lot of pushback internally at Plymouth. They didn't want to be associated with a cartoon. They thought it was a bad idea, but they moved forward with it. They moved forward with it very carefully. They didn't want it to be cartoonish, so they made the Roadrunner black and white. That car took off so well in 1968 and sold so many units by mid-year, they were putting the colored birds on the applique that went on the back of the decor packages. And by 1969, it was full color Roadrunner birds. So, called history. Gotta make sure this one sticks pretty good because it's on a textured surface. Are you excited, Sandy? Oh, yes. <laughs> so how long have you and Papa all been married? 63 years. 63 years. Mamaw, is she like what you thought? Yeah, yeah, it looks She's just it, like it did. Just like it did. In 1968, Plymouth introduced the GTX, right on the same platform as the Roadrunner, but the gentleman's muscle car, the loaded luxury version. True or false, GTX stood for Grand Touring Extreme. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned right after the break. We'll find out how you did. All right, folks, welcome back. How'd you do on that one? Did you say that GTX stood for Grand Touring Extreme? If you did, congratulations, you are absolutely wrong. As a matter of fact, I just made that up, Grand Touring Extreme, it's not even a thing. GTX didn't stand for anything, not a thing. So there's even an introductory tape made by Mopar back in the day that calls it a Gittix. <laughs> the guy says, the 1968 Gittix. So it didn't stand for
We do a lot of cars here, and it's easy to say, well, this one's my favorite, or this one might be, but this particular car, while it is pretty simple, it's not very flashy, it looked nice when I brought it over here, but when Justin put it together, I had no idea the two-tone blue interior, you know, really set that car off. The red stripes on the tires set that car off. You have three different shades of blue on this car, so it's just little things that you pay more attention to when it doesn't get the stripes or any of the fancy decals or anything like that. You kind of appreciate a whole different aspect of what I do. Growing up, Mark and I loved our Mopars. This car here, with its blue paint, Magnum 500s, two-tone interior, just turned out to be a beautiful car. It's stunning. So you know, my dad plays like he's some big tough guy, but really, honestly, he's a big softy with a big heart, and I think this restoration shows it more than anything. He didn't do this restoration because it was a high dollar car. He did it because this meant so much to the owners. And I love that my dad did that for them. The coolest part about this build was the fact that it was the one owner car and that it all comes down to family at the end of the day. They're gonna get to enjoy this car as a family now. All right, 1968 Roadrunner going out on a maiden voyage in it. I did take it down and have the alignment done the other day, but I have not driven it since then. We're really short on time. This car's gonna be leaving in the next couple of days, which is why right now you don't see a back seat in there. You know, besides the fact that these cars really drive nice, they are their own unique style. They're square, they're boxy. They look like a block of cheese cutting through the wind, right? They don't look like anything sporty and sexy until you fall in love with them. And then when you fall in love with them and you see all the cool styling cues, from the front bumper, to the grill, to the cool hood, to the long quarter panels that are sleek and just flow into the doors and pick it back up into the fenders. This car, when you learn to appreciate the Mopars, is one of the cutest and sexiest cars ever made. Second gear was nice. Uh, Pass on built the transmission for this. Always does a phenomenal job. This is a non-tachometer car, no N85 in this one. It is an AM radio car. That's about it for options. It always warms my heart seeing my dad drive these cars. He's always loved these cars. Since I can remember, we've always had a Mopar. When I was five years old, I think around five, he bought a Superbird. And there's even pictures with, of me with it. And um, so I kind of have a love for them now, too. Feels nice, got a good grip on the road. A lot of play in that old steering, and it's all brand new, folks. But it's still got a lot of play. I do that, you don't see much motion in the car. But that's all right. That's, these weren't built for handling. They weren't autocross cars. These cars were born to boogie. Quarter mile, cheap as you can get. Now, the reason this thing has so much slop in it when you're driving down the road is the steering is referred to as an integral steering, all right? That means it has a series of linkage and connections that make it up. The steering shaft goes down to a steering gear. Out of the steering gear is a pitman arm. That goes to a relay rod, which goes over to an idler arm. It has inner and outer tie rod ends on it and a tie rod sleeve that connects them. You've got lower ball joints, upper ball joints. Those are your moving points on this thing. That's a lot of stuff to have play in it. Versus today's technology and the stuff that Ron down at Magnum Force builds, you can have a rack and pinion. That takes all of those extra pieces out of it and gives you a super tight suspension and steering. However, back in that day, Integral steering is what you got. It's a manual drum brake car, manual steering. So good luck with that, Mr. Curtis. I know that you were a younger man when you bought this car brand new, so I hope you still got a little bit of that muscle in that leg and arms. That feels good. You know, the last time I drove one of these cars that was manual steering and manual brakes was Goldberg's 1968 GTX. That was a number of matching 440 Super Commando four-speed car. And I remember it was exhausting, especially if you're in a parking lot, cranking that thing. Now, this one drives a little bit nicer than that. However, for Goldberg, that's not a problem, right? He's got muscles on top of muscles. That's his kind of car. In fact, he didn't want one with power steering and power brakes because he said that was a sissy car. So I guess, Mr. Curtis, you're in good company now. You and Bill Goldberg the last two American macho men left in the planet.
brakes are breaking evenly, which is kind of unusual for drums. A lot of times they're all over the place, but these are all new, so I would expect them to function like they're supposed to. It is so cool to see this car done and put together. The color looks great, the paint looks great, the two-tone interior looks great, and just seeing this thing drive down the road is pretty rewarding. Gauges are working, what, what there is of them. Uh, we have a fuel gauge, a temperature gauge, and a charging gauge. Well, an alternator gauge tells you if the system's charging. Uh, we have a heater. Since this is a pretty plain Roadrunner, you know, there's not much, you know, crazy decals or anything that goes on this. We added the white pinstripe, which really kind of broke up the body of the car. And really, it's a small detail, but it added so much character to this car. Actually, Mr. Falfa, we didn't add a stripe to it. It's a 68 Roadrunner and it was coded for the stripe, so we went ahead and put it back on. Now, really what you should do is pay more attention to the option codes and less time taking shots at the ice tray. Gundas, Mr. Gundas. I'll tell you the other thing I love on this car right now, <laughs> ECS helped us out with the exhaust on this because I forgot to order it. I know you find that difficult to believe. You know, it was a bit of a miracle on this car. I had overlooked the exhaust system. That's my fault, nobody else's fault. There's a lot of parts on these cars and it takes a lot to put them together. Now, one thing I would like to thank is Tom at ECS, guys that do our exhaust for taking care of me on this car. We had four days to finish the car when I realized I didn't have the exhaust system for it. That's just one of the things that happens when you're doing a lot of the work yourself, you tend to forget things. So I called them up, it was the day before a big car show, I don't remember what one they were going to, and they stopped over the weekend put a complete system together, next day an exhaust system to me, and we had it on the car and ready to ship. So a huge thank you to those guys for taking care of me. The lack of prior planning on my part seemed to have constituted an emergency on your part, and I appreciate that. It's kind of sad on this one that we weren't able to have the Curtises out for the reveal, because that's always a, a great time just to kind of visit with them, find out all the stories you can, and really truly get the expression on their face when they see their car for the first time. But it was wonderful, because Mrs. Curtis took the time to record everything back there, and we have it. And they were so thrilled. It's such a special moment. In fact, I'll be honest, in some ways, I think you got more of a natural reaction out of the people because they weren't sitting in front of a camera like this. Most people aren't used to doing it, so they're a little bit more conservative. These people were so thrilled and they didn't bother to hide it. Good morning. Yep, the car is here. She is about to pull in the driveway. All the way back from Oregon. Oh my goodness. Jack, now how old are you? I'm 80. 80. You've waited five years I for this it, car. I bought, it, I bought it 53 years ago. 53 years ago. Stan was three and a half. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let you put the final touch on, Stan. This restoration turned out beautiful, but my favorite part about it is the fact that it's a one owner vehicle. So this has to be so cool for the kids now that they're grown up to look back and see the car that they went to school in, the car they probably got dinner in a million times. That must be like a blast from the past for them. And so I love that. If I had a cool enough car to keep around for the rest of my life, I can't imagine being able to restore it and live those memories again. We all have memories of this car. We've waited all five years. Everybody has been waiting for this day for Jack to get reunited with his car. I was in the sandbox at the block church when you pulled up and you got out and said you want to go for a ride. I got out of the sandbox and went straight to the back seat, jumped straight in the back seat. 
I remember the day he drove it home. Jackie, what do you remember about when it first came? We heard a meet me, and we didn't know what was going on. Did you hear the beep beep that Jackie did? I did, but I, I couldn't figure it out because I wasn't watching Roadrunner. I was watching Bugs Bunny. <laughs> so how long have you and Papa been married? 63 years. 63 years. What I remember about that car, it was about the second time he drove it. He went by a Mennonite farm, and they had some calves they were selling. He bought a calf and put it in the back seat of that new car. It scoured all over. <laughs> Do you have any memories about this car? I, listen, I told you, I tried to buy this car like 50 times, and he never would sell it. He always said, I'm going to fix it up one day, and I'm like, sure you are, you know, and so uh, I'm excited for it. I am too. So, now who is this gentleman? He's the one who sold it to me. You are the man that sold him the car. Well, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You did a good deed for this family. I'm going to give his money back. So I would just like to say to Mr. Curtis, congratulations. You are a multiple cancer survivor. You are a fighter. And you bought a car that has been with you your entire life. And I would like to thank you personally for allowing me to be able to work on this car and bring it back to life for you. I think it is a wonderful thing for you to have in the family and a gesture that I am blessed to have been able to make. So you enjoy that car and have a lot of fun with it. You and your family and your grandkids and their kids after that. And the only reason I did this was for you. Well, and bunts and burners. <laughs> nice little earners. Cash. ka -ching. But you guys cut the part about the money, right? Just leave it real sentimental. Florida in it. Stan was saying that seven of you went to Tampa in the car. We did. I remember riding in the floorboard in the back seat. What do you riding remember in, about Riding that? in the back of the windshield. You used to have to fight to ride in the yeah, back of the true. windshield. That's true. <laughs> there you have it, folks. 1968 Roadrunner, one owner, and that is Jack Curtis from Summertown, Tennessee. So, you know, we can restore these cars for people who have the money to buy the really expensive one-of-one -one cars. It's the restorations that mean something to someone, that means something to an entire family. This is why we do restorations. Yes, it's cool to be around the really rare cars, but it's even better when you can be a part of someone's memories.